Oi, if you're new to my channel, basically uh, I read off AI papers, my highlights of them anyways, and I give my thoughts and opinions. Let's get to it. Computational Natural Philosophy, a thread from pre-Socratics through Turing to ChatGPT. This paper is more for the philosophers in here. Um, this is a first uh, paper of that type, I guess. I like this one because it's like more of a, a well-rounded just glance at every little piece that might touch um, chat GPT and AI nowadays and language modeling. Um, although it's really true though that like reading this paper is not going to give you any idea of those actual philosophers thoughts on a given subject and what they would think about it if they were still alive. You got to actually read them for that. Um, but it is an interesting uh, little vantage point uh, to kind of reframe your minds, stay away from the math a little bit. My channel is a lot of math usually, but this is not, and it's a nice little change of pace, I guess. All right, predecessors were the Greeks, of course, as always, that's, that's dumb. I also want to say, like, um, I forget, never mind. Natural philosophy was only viewed as one aspect of philosophy. However, Rene Descartes believed that the universe could be understood through mathematics and logical reasoning. Uh, that kind of set all this up. Pascal constructed the first mechanical calculator, also mathematician, and Leibniz improved, so it's Descartes, I guess, definitely, but Leibniz improved it and, among others, invented the binary system of counting. Um, all these people were always both philosophers and mathematicians. It was all the same thing back then. Uh, Galileo's contribution was the mathemat mathematization of science, so he was the first one to really like actually start using data to like verify his um his hypotheses. That's this whole thing with the planets and stuff. Is he verified uh, his model of the celestial orbits and everything by collecting crazy intense data um, for the time, anyways. Newton exposed natural philosophy as the great mother of the sciences, so kind of reframing it as like the birthplace where all other uh, discovery stems from. Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace developed the concept of the analytical engine, a machine that could perform mathematical calculations through a series of punched cards. This was really the first computer, basically. Um, I know we give Turing credit for that, but it's kind of both. Like these Babbage and Lovelace, my impression is that they just like built the first working machine, but didn't have like a really great working theory or like uh, or idea of what it would become. Whereas Turing really defined what computation is. Uh, Leibniz's work on logic and formal systems provided a foundation for the development of programming languages and computer algorithms. So actual philosophical based logic systems uh, are upstream of programming languages, which is pretty interesting. The present day success of ChatGPT may be seen as the beginning of the realization of Leibniz's dream about encyclo an encyclopedia of all human knowledge built and ran by computational means corresponding to calculus of reasoning, operating over all information and knowledge of humanity. It really is, when you phrase it like that, a really good fit. Like it's built by calculus to create reasoning. So I guess kind of calculus of reasoning, but he more so meant like the math, math, mathematization. I'm not saying that right. This The strictness of um, its definitions, but we're going to do a little interpreting right there, a little fun with the words anyways. Um, and it really does have like, the entire internet almost i mean it's not perfect it remembers like a humanist there's issues with it for sure but it's got a lot of knowledge in a relatively small data size like think about how much of the internet is contained in ChatGPT's parameters like so densely and how small the actual file of just its weights is alan turing is recognized for its contributions to the theory of computation the turing machine and he was the first ai researcher he's actually the first person um, and connectionist models of learning in the form of unorganized machines and neural networks. So the actual, people don't know this, people think that neural networks are new, but like the first neural net paper was in 1948 from Alan Turing, which is crazy. I guess like back then they weren't, I think he was thinking of it in terms of binary, zeros and ones still, because that's of like um, inspiration from biology. Um, and there was definitely a lot to be learned and they weren't big enough to actually do anything yet. But, um, but technically, yeah, first neural net, 1948. Uh, biographer Andrew Hodge sees Turing primarily as a natural philosopher. His thoughts and life were a generation ahead of his time, and the aspects of his ideas that transcended the 1940s boundaries are best captured using the old-fashioned term, natural philosophy. 
It is worth noticing that Turing's natural philosophy extends beyond Galileo's belief that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Computing, in a sense, exceeds mathematics, as computers do not only represent numbers and relationships, but also can generate real-time behaviors. So, whereas uh, Galileo is like, we can measure and think about the universe with math, uh, Turing said, no, 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 not just that, we can also use said math, aka computation, to act in the universe. The universe actually um, can be affected by said computation. A major development in computational natural philosophy was the emergence of connectionism, which modeled intelligent behavior using artificial neural networks inspired by the human brain. The backprop algorithm, a key innovation in this area, enabled neural networks to learn from data and make predictions, enabling more complex AI models and deep learning. If you're a philosophy person, you're not sure what backprop is. Basically, um, uh, it's calculus. It's just gradients from calculus. If you don't know what that is, uh, imagine like uh, you are in a giant area of hills and valleys and to get to the solution to your problem you need to get to the lowest possible point in the lowest possible valley and it is pitch black dark uh you can't see anything well what do you do is you see well any given place you're standing is hopefully not flat it's got like some angle to the hill on it right so what you do is you just walk straight downhill that's what backprop is in terms of calculus right and like getting to the bottom of that lowest valley is the definition of like uh, solving uh, or finishing training of solving a problem of creating a finished neural network that is properly trained. In 1967, Conrad Zeus first proposed the idea that the entire universe might be functioning as a computational system at a fundamental level using cellular automata as a model. Cellular automata are these very simple little pieces with simple little rules where you, when you, um, put a bunch of them together and you have them act out said rules over time, they can sometimes create very simple and boring patterns and whatnot, and sometimes create absolutely crazy stuff. Stephen Wolfram supports a pan-computationalist perspective, advocating for a dynamic type of reductionism where the complexity of natural behaviors and structures arises from a limited set of basic structures and processes. So these two guys essentially think that like the smallest component of the universe atoms whatever you can think of their laws of physics as cellular automata basically um, and that what the universe really does is it just computes it um it computes the next time step it moves information basically um, and that this kind of dynamic reductionism and, and as opposed to regular regular reductionism which is more like we can understand the components and therefore understand the whole this dynamic reductionism means that we can understand the components but not understand the whole because when you combine these components with simple rules and you find enough of them uh it can actually become too much to take into account in your head and uh eventually the, the macro behaviors are too complicated to really understand per se and if understanding means to actually be able to play it out and simulate the whole thing in your head fredkin put forth his digital philosophy suggesting that cellular automata could give rise to particle physics, so along the same lines. Even though the majority of computational theories assume discrete computing nature, the neural network models compute continuous value data. So um, old neural networks just did ones and zeros on and off switches, basically, the like Turing level and even into the 80s and 90s ones, and even now it's, they're called spiking neural networks. Um, and a lot of the computational theories, including Turing's computational machine, I believe was completely discrete. And technically the computers we use today are still discrete, but we emulate, we fictionally like kind of pretend to create continuous value data, continuous as in like, there is no, like it's a continuous stream. There is no on off. There are no gaps between. We kind of emulate that using what's called floating point values. And they're not actually continuous. There is like, if you zoom in enough, they actually are discrete, but in, for all intents and purposes, the, the level of resolution of these floating point numbers is so small that they might as well be continuous. Um, they are effectively approximate continuity, and current neural networks use those continuous values in them rather than discrete values. Greg Chaitin has made significant contributions to the field of computing, computing nature, beginning with information theory and computation as information processing. One of his key areas of focus has been information compression, which he famously described as compression is comprehension. This is a super interesting point being brought up again more recently in the realm of neural networks and everything. Is like 
effectively what you're doing uh, to understand a problem, what you're effectively doing is you are breaking it down into its simplest possible components that are still uh, completely covering all aspects of said problem, whatever the dimensionality, the lowest number of things you need to know for that problem is. And in a way, in the sense that like the raw data is not compressed, the raw data that's training the models, the compression is when the model figures out a low, a lower dimensional dimension representation for that data. Um, it is essentially compression. So it's really interesting this dynamic of compression is comprehension. Getting into information theory and everything is a whole can of worms in its own that I'm not going to do right now, but it's all super interesting. He has also put forward the notion of life as evolving software. This is a big belief I have is um, this idea of a separate life force dualism. I don't think is right. I think even as far as the heart problem of consciousness, I think people underestimate the extent to which it is really just pattern on objects, like in pattern being information effectively. In the words of Greg Chaitin, and how about the entire universe? Can it be considered to be a computer? Yes, it certainly can. It is constantly computing its future state from its current state. It's constantly computing its own time evolution. And as I believe Tom to fully pointed out, actual computers like your PC just hitch a ride on this universal computation. This idea of the universal computation is super interesting. Um, if you look at a simulation theory, people say like, oh, the world is a simulation by some alien species is more advanced or something. No, I mean like the universe is computational and to that extent it could be a simulation, but it doesn't make any sense in my mind anyways to say that those aliens simulating us in their little in their little video game of Earth, I don't think it makes any sense to say that like their universe is non-computational but can have computation within it. Now when I say that it makes no sense. Like I don't even know how that would even happen. So I guess to the extent that I don't know, I guess it could happen. But really I think a lot of the simulation theory stuff is overblown uh the base level can just be computation you don't need to have a actual conscious being god alien per se to compute you um we could just have the base level be computation the fundamental mechanism is morphological comp computation i.e a process of transformations of the structure form and arrangements of parts within a whole those processes can be described as information self-organization this idea here uh, is was first described in nature, I believe, by Turing, the idea of morphological computation. Um, it's essentially like complicated patterns arising from relatively simple rules uh, and bottom-up kind of local first decision-making. So Turing, I think, recognized, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong on this, that the computing model he had didn't fully and adequately describe what's happening in biological life. Their biological life is still computing, but it's just that the simple layout he, like his initial Turing machine had, wasn't quite comprehensive enough. And that if you want to look into self-organization and all this stuff, I have a video on it called like Seven Properties of Self-Organization in the Human Brain, I think. I forget. But um, super interesting stuff. Uh, Joshua Bach, uh, Michael Levy are big people in this area nowadays. For cognitive agents, morphological computing in living nature is a network of informational processes with cognition as layered morphological computation. In robotics, specific use of the term morphological computation has been adopted to denote decentralized embodied control of robots, where appropriate body morphology saves central information processing resources and enables learning through the self-structuring information. So rather than in a robot having a bunch of body parts and a big brain computer, instead you can have the finger or the, the ankle joint or whatever do its own calculations. This is what's happening in your body when you touch a hot stove, right? Um, you touch a hot stove and your hand reflexively pulls back immediately. Like that's a super low level computation where like the neurons in your hand sense pain. They send messages to the muscles in your arm to pull back and it does so. And only after you've pulled back, do you really actually perceive in your brain what the fuck just happened? Um, excuse my cursing. Uh, and this isn't just like a, and I know you're probably thinking, oh, well, no, I, I think to pull back and I, no, no, we, we can neurologically, it's been measured that like the very clearly the pullback happens before your brain is aware of it. When we actually put like EEGs on people's heads and on their arms and stuff, we put electrodes on there. It's very clear that 
your arm, your hand, and the neurons in there do their own computation. And this idea can be transferred to robotics. It is important to keep in mind the difference between new computational models of intrinsic information processes in nature uh, and old computationalism based on the computer metaphor of the Turing machine, performing symbol processing, which has been rightly criticized as inadequate model of human cognition. So the Turing machine, like I said, inadequate earlier, only works the level of symbols, um, whereas uh, you need something more dynamic and flexible and bottom up in order to actually model human cognition and neurons are closer to that neurons they just forsake symbols entirely they say we don't care about your pre-imposed rules and symbols and code and whatnot we're going to just arbitrarily kind of learn this thing with weird algorithms that are um, not inherently understandable in the sense that they are not symbolic Natural computation involves multi-level processes of computing and distributed information communication capable of capturing the dynamic behavior of natural cognitive agents, including neural networks. Natural computation manifests itself at various levels of organization in nature, including the physical, chemical, biological, and cognitive domains. Of particular interest are the levels of chemical and biological computation that contribute to cognitive behavior. Vincent Muller expresses criticism of computing nature in a dialogue article with the author, I guess, oh my god, what the heck? Sorry. I guess the author of this paper, I don't know. Arguing that if computation is everywhere and applies to everything, it does not explain anything. The response of the author was that computation appears in different forms at different levels of organization of matter, in a similar way as matter presents a universal principle but is diversified at different levels of organization and therefore presents a useful theoretical tool for understanding nature. I'd further posit like everything you propose as a cause for everything will either be part of that everything or separate from that everything and therefore not provable. So like you can say no to computation being everywhere and you can say, no, it's God instead, but like you're just positing a separate cause or, because you have this urge to have causation outside of the universe, causation can just be within the structure of the universe. Um, you, by positing an outside mover, haven't actually done anything. You just added an extra variable to the equation that we have no proof of. Um, whereas to say that computation explains everything is the same as saying, yeah, matter explains everything. Not in the sense that all matter is the exact same, but in the sense that the differences in matter is what cause differences in things, um, all that stuff. Uh, I'm just not fond of the critique that first guy gave. Roger Penrose has expressed criticism of computationalism. Penrose here suggests quantum processes underlying consciousness. This, I'm also... I don't disagree it could be the case, but I don't think it's... I'm not sure it's necessary. I think it, we, it may be the case that computation is sufficient. I know computation is necessary for consciousness, right? I think I know anyways. Um, but I think it's also sufficient as well. I don't doubt that quantum effects could play a role insofar as quantum processes can be used in computation. When Penrose writes that consciousness is uncomputable, he argues it is not algorithmic in the sense of the Turing machine. That is a well-established position even within modern computational approaches. Instead, distributed asynchronous and concurrent models of computation are necessary. Yeah, it's like, sure, it's not algorithmic. Um, there's randomness involved. There's inherent um, randomness involved. Uh, but it's still computation at the end of the day. Like, you can't just have quantum processes that are like what is our quantum process conscious now? I mean, maybe there's that whole uh, uh, closing or whatever of the the wave function or whatever it's called that consciousness does. I have no doubt that there's some kind of inter intertwined thing there, um, but I, I I don't know. I'm just I feel like we might be able to actually do uh, regular computers, digital computers, and have them conscious. We'll, we'll see. Human intelligence is even to this day by many considered to be impossible to implement in machines, assumed as being substantially different in nature, and supposed to be non-material or at least non-mechanistic. 
based on simple principles known within the AI for several decades, the AI field, I guess. From the beginning of deep neural networks, recent developments differ only in the following. They are applying much bigger neural networks, trained on vast amounts of data with thousands of fast GPUs and large computer clusters that run for several weeks with elaborate infrastructure, optimization of neural networks, and architectures like transformers. So yeah, really, nothing fundamentally has changed since Turing's 1948 paper. We're doing roughly the same thing. Now, there were other approaches tried in that time, symbolic approaches, a bunch of stuff, but I think fundamentally like deep learning has just gotten bigger and as it's gotten bigger it's just magically worked better we haven't actually done too much on like our ingenuity side or anything to change what's happening since what turing said researchers like yashua benjo believe the power of hybrid computing models meaning involving both dnns and symbolic computing um i agree to a certain extent i think in terms of utility like using something somewhere uh it's much faster to if you can write an algorithm for part of a task, just write the algorithm. That's so much faster and cheaper and easier and more reliable and interpretable. But then, like, not all tasks can ha have easily like human written algorithms for them. At that point, incorporating in neural networks, right? So I, I totally agree. Like in terms of solving tasks, yes, um, neuro symbolic computing, definitely the way to go whenever we can. But in terms of like consciousness per se or whatever, or, um, or, or even just AGI, I don't know. It is important to emphasize that Turing test, which GPT programs can pass, they really can, is not a test of consciousness, but shows the ability of a mach machine to produce believable human dialogue, which says nothing about consciousness. Yeah, I agree. But it's also this thing where like, if it walks, talks, quacks like a duck, you have to treat it like a duck. You have to assume, imagine it's conscious. So, Red means I disagreed. Okay. The question of generating new knowledge, not from a huge corpus of existing human knowledge, but de novo, is a different issue. LLMs produce new knowledge from the existing one. That is why GPT programs are trained on huge amounts of humanly produced text, which required conscious and physical presence in the world while it was being created. The situation is similar to the synthetic biology which can produce a living cell by combining parts of disassembled cells. It is still not capable of producing a living cell de novo from a container with organic molecules that living cell is composed of. I, I disagree. I think we underestimate the extent to which creativity is just combination of prior components. Um, I, 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 the thing is, the current models, GPT and whatnot, have been trained not to be creative, but to be average. This is actually how the training works of predicting the next token, the most, most likely token, is they are seriously encouraged to be average, to give average thoughts. They are encouraged to, like, to not be creative. That's how they are trained, right? I don't know how we're going to surpass that. I have a few ideas as to how to make them more creative, but at least for now, that I think is the reason. I don't think that the fact that they are learning from combinations of prior knowledge is what limits them no because that's what humans do too is we also do that um th this idea that like creativity has to emerge from some special human thing i don't think is right but um i think is that it maybe yep that's it uh if you enjoyed this hop in my discord like subscribe add the hit the bell you know whatever um youtubers should be telling you to do please do those things uh, leave some comments again, I'll join the discord. Yeah. End of video.